thanks very much, Guy. Thanks for coming today because um, I believe that there's uh, Rene like um, uh, earlier today, but uh, you guys managed to come and um, welcome to the Earth Hub. And uh, this place is uh, where we try to, you know, engage more green innovation and also invest more in um, a climate tech solution. So uh, the main reason of today is uh, actually is, um, to um, get involved, you guys, and understand more about our next chance in terms of uh, uh, investment, in terms of venture investment, in terms of um, entrepreneurship, what we should do, because uh, it's a very important, and I think it's, um, uh, it, it's a, the, the time uh, that just happened you know, now, not um, uh, in the previous year, as really different, really different for Vietnam, for the whole world, and especially in uh, venture capital. So um, it's great to have um, the most to join us today. And uh, I believe it's great if uh, we have a, uh, a short introduction uh, before we can jump into my um, uh, sharing. Is that okay? Please, the most? Yep. No problem. So hello, everybody. I cannot see some of you, but that's OK. That's great. Um, you, my name is Dermot Berkery, and I am a general partner with a venture capital fund in Europe, uh, mainly in Ireland, called Delta Partners. And you probably won't have heard of us before, but we've been investing in seed opportunities and are very early stage venture capital opportunities since 1994, so a very long time with many funds um, during that period. And we've invested in around 130 to 140 companies over that time period. And we get in and we talk about um, our successes and our failures a little bit um, throughout this session. Um, but really the way to think about us is we are somewhat expert in making investments in very early stage opportunities. And I'd like to congratulate Tien before we get going on the magnificent work that he's done on translating and, um, you know, uh, his contributions to the entrepreneurial sector, not just over there, but a little bit over here as well. Thanks. Thanks very much. And um, I, I believe that um, the main purpose of today actually is uh, uh, get engaged with um, 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 the most Buckery and also uh, um, from my side sharing a little bit about what we're trying to do, what is our mission in terms of um, starting off this kind of uh, project. It's a not-for-profit project that we then sponsor on kind of uh, the um, uh, license for the book. Uh, translators, myself, I do not gain anything from, from the book. And uh, actually, it's just um, trying to booster and the, um, uh, the, the ecosystem, especially venture capital and uh, startup. So uh, the key thing here actually is um, some of my sharing. Um, if, if you guys are familiar with uh, this kind of activity, it's um, the well-in activities back in uh, the 19th century. It's a, uh, for me, it's a kind of a first form of venture capital. When investor put some money in those uh, galley that go to the Atlantic Sea and also try to um, get the whale. So it's uneasy to hunt the whale. For some galleys, just go like seven years without seeing any. So it's really risk, uh, really risky, uh, but it's gained a lot of uh, money if you can hunt the whale because uh, you got fat for the whale that can fuel the, the fire and, and also um, uh, light the candle. At that point of time, there's no oil and gas, anything. And also uh, uh, meat from the whale also. So it's the very first form of venture capital so we can see that the venture capital is risky. Rare people, courage people that can go and take the, the reward down to that uh, Atlantic Ocean. So what, what we try to uh, engage more here is uh, uh, the, the main uh, sharing of myself today is uh, about the, um, uh, the book itself and uh, why it's important to me and why I, uh, myself and Wizen need to, you know, um, do this project and bring that one in uh, the Vietnamese version to you guys. Uh, the, as you remember, the book is the Raising Venture Capital for the Serious Entrepreneur. And you guys come today, I believe you guys are really serious. 
because it's rainy today. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a, also Saturday afternoon, but people still stood up and come here and networking. So once again, thank you very much to come. And uh, for myself, uh, I graduate my bachelor in Vietnam. Uh, I got the scholarship by the Irish government to uh, study in Ireland. So uh, I'm the um, a fellow by the Irish government. So uh, for now, I run uh, Wizin, the, um, the uh, venture investment platform, and EarthVC is a VC fund focused on climate tech. And so far, we invested in uh, uh, eight startups throughout the world, uh, four in Singapore, one in Hong Kong, two in Israel, and uh, also America. Um, I graduated from UCD Dublin, where I first time uh, saw the book in the library. It's a... Uh, I must say that it's uh, the book that um, really important for anyone that study entrepreneurship. So uh, I just recognize that uh, okay, it's, it must be uh, written by somebody from many years ago. I did not know that that guy today can sit there at uh, 9 a.m. in Dublin and uh, share the story with myself. He's still alive. So that's, well, for me, it's surprising because normally I, I read some book and you know the. The, the author is uh, elsewhere. So, and uh, also, I uh, got another master's degree in uh, Xinhua University, where I also uh, um, uh, uh, teach some uh, program in, uh, um, I think, can, can you get me my laptop? Uh, yeah, just over there. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, in uh, Schwartzman Scholar, um, in Swartman, uh, I did my, uh, let me see. Okay, perfect now. Okay, perfect now. So I got my, uh, another master degree from Xinhua University and do some teaching for um, the Swartman Scholar in uh, Xinhua. Uh, my background basically in the uh, uh, strategy, business strategy. So with the mixture of Vietnam and Ireland, I would like to share something today. So actually, don't worry. It's uh, just stories. And I hope to get more you know, insight from you guys. And we also do some networking. So this is Vietnam, the balcony to DSC. And uh, we see that we uh, kind of, uh, um, for a long time, we always believe that our country is a country of war, the Vietnam War. Many people, many friends, foreigners, talk about Vietnam War more than anything else. We got prop, um, poverty. We, we got uh, you know, the population that we, we don't recognize the strange of it. And that is Vietnam. And 15 years ago, when uh, mm, the, the book is still uh, in uh, the most mind, uh, not written yet, in Vietnam, it's like this. I think it's similar to today, with all own kind of traffic jam, uh, except the helmets. But it's like that. But we got more cars now compared to, uh, you know, a motorbike. And 15 years ago, is the internet cafe. And we, we must say that there's uh, um, more foreigners in the internet cafe than today, right? Today, we see more teenagers, even kids uh, come, come there to play, to hang out. And, uh, but normally, they, they can use their, their technology devices now. Uh, so we see a lot of them are foreigners. They come there to check emails. They come there to use the facility that uh, uh, Vietnamese do not get used to back then. 15 years ago, even some, some black guy also come there. So 15 years ago, we got the award name Vietnam Mobile Award, and it's come to uh, mobile phone. And we see some name there is uh, Nokia, still there. I wonder if uh, anyone still use Nokia today. No, maybe to protect you, not to make a phone call, right? And 15 years ago, if we search on the very popular media here, it says Tech in Asia. I think nowadays many people use Tech in Asia. It was just the word like Vietnam startup ecosystem 15 years ago. It's not nothing like that. 
we're going to ask that point of time, tech in Asia is not crowded yet. So we see that 15 years ago seems not really long, but it's truly long if we talk about technology, startup, and venture investment. At that point of time, Zinmei is uh, really popular. Zinmei is like this. Even for now, I cannot find any photo with uh, high resolution uh, in terms of um, Zinmei. But back then, it's Zinmei. And if you remember this, right? <laughs> the, the first uh, block that many people used to write on that. But now more people write on Facebook, on you know, Instagram, anything else. Uh, it just disappeared. It's Yahoo. If you remember this, you got a very great childhood, right? <laughs> very great memory then. Okay, it's, uh, but it's in the past now. It's not here. It's uh, technology destroy a lot of things. And uh, we, we see how, how old we are, right? And talk about Ireland. Ireland is over there and really similar to Vietnam in terms of Vietnam is next door to a very huge empire, which is uh, China. Ireland is next to the United Kingdom. So they got influence, they got a lot of conflicts, and they're really similar to us. So this is Ireland, and this is uh, their story. 15 years ago, this is Ireland. This is uh, the bucket bridge where they, uh, with the shape of the, the harp and also the convention down on the river. But besides that, there's a lot of conflict about the tax, about the job opportunity, and a lot of parade, unrest 15 years ago. Look at Ireland 15 years ago. We can see that they, they got a great time before that, what we call the uh, Celtic Tiger, when they grow really fast because they the gateway for the American to get into Europe and vice versa. So they got many opportunities in terms of the, the whole country. But uh, at that point of time, it's going down because of the, um, uh, the, the problem of the, uh, the uh, public, uh, the, the public loan. It become, uh, because they in the uh, uh, European Commission. So it leads to the, the fact that uh, they can uh, lend a lot of money from the uh, EU bank. And then this leads to um, the spend of the government. Like if we look at the spending of the government compared to their revenue is unhealthy. So it leads to one time that the economic disaster of Ireland back then, 15 years ago. And if we look at the things like this, it's a general government um, financial balances. And Ireland is down below there. If we compare to the Eurozone, it's uh, in the blue one, the United States, or um, Greece, Greece is just over there. So they, they're at the very bottom of many developed countries back then. So if we compare to the economies of Vietnam and the economies of Ireland back then, Vietnam is, what do you think? Still stable, if we look at it, if we look at it. Yes, uh, we, we, we know that they, they come from the developed world uh, they next, they in Europe, they next to the UK, they must have, have a better economy. But I, I don't think so. 15 years ago, is Vietnam is more stable. But what happened now? When they go back, when they develop, Greece is still there. Greece still in the, uh, the, the uh, public debt um, situation. So 15 years ago, we see a lot of things like... Uh, if you're familiar with the, the Limerick brothers, Patrick and John Collison, have you heard of them? But I believe that you heard of Stripe, the company called Stripe. They founders of Stripe. Yeah, huge, really huge company. And uh, uh, WordPress also back in that time. And Facebook chooses Dublin to be their European headquarter back then. And also back then, is a time that Apple launches the first iPad. And uh, we are now 
with the news of uh, the iPhone uh, 15. But back then, it's the first iPad. And Microsoft back then still have the keynote, everything. But look at the whole thing here. I believe that one thing that Ireland is uh, better than Vietnam back then, not the economics itself, but or the technology adoption. They've been chosen to be. They've been chosen to be uh, the European headquarter of many big tech names. So that's the game. That's their strategy to escape from the situation. So if we look at this here, they plan to be the startup Nirvana to attract more the global talents. And in some years, uh, uh, like 2010, Enterprise Island also, they, for many years, is a very active investor. And they run, they backed by the government. And also, the Mosheer's fund also worked really closely with the uh, Enterprise Island. So it's one thing that we, um, I think he can sh share more about the dip difference between uh, uh, Irish uh, VC industry and uh, you, uh, American, uh, American one. So um, with the government back in, there's a lot of things has been done in Ireland. And if we look at the ranking of the uh, countries with G GDP per capita, we usually see Ireland as a top one, two, something. Now, it's now. So how can they escape from that situation? You can see us going down and uh, the public debt and also the, the government spending. It's uneasy to, to escape, but they did it. We, Vietnam, 15 years ago, more stable. We got something, uh, we got a lot of problem with corruption. I believe so, every country has got that problem. Uh, but we do not fly as fast as this, this country of Ireland. So that's the, the question that's also in my mind for those years when, when I study and work in Ireland. So also, if we look at the fastest growing economies in Europe throughout those periods of time, Ireland with that speed can compare to many others over there. And about the VC funding, there's an um, uh, agency, uh, organization named um, Iris VC Association, and they publish those things. If we uh, see the numbers, for example, just quarter, for example, yeah, that number is, uh, uh, I think, 500,000 500, uh, K. So it's like 500, um, 500 million, right? 500 million for just one quarter. You, you know how much money committed into the VC world in Vietnam? Can you guess? 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion for so many years that the first VC is uh, IDG Ventures that invested in Vietnam. 1.5. If we compare to this company for just one quarter, 500 million, it's uh, really different. But look at more things, more about the demographics. Ireland is a very small country compared to Vietnam. Vietnam can, com can be compared to uh, Germany. If we put Vietnam in the middle of um, uh, Europe. What is the population? It's 5 million, less than Ho Chi Minh City. Vietnam is nearly 100 million now. So there's a lot of different things here. Uh, this thing and also the GDP, the GDP is something that we can compare, but it's not apple to apple because uh, we huge country in terms of uh, geography, in terms of population, but it's one country. So what is the difference? That's also the, the question that I also ask myself. Vietnamese, Vietnamese people in Dublin also ask themselves, but uh, I don't think that Irish people ask themselves. <laughs> they, they're always surprised because uh, Vietnam got really huge population. They never know, but uh, there must be something. And uh, they got really big name. For example, if you're familiar with Kinspan, the really big Stripe, Work Human, or Smurfit Capper, or if you in Europe, definitely uh, normally you use a right name because it's a uh, very uh, um, popular low cost airline. And just today, 
Enterprise Island retain the most active domestic investor in venture. So they support really, really much in the, the world of startup. Their role is uh, undeniable. But why? Again, so if uh, from my side, I do believe that the productivity is something that we, we need to consider, which just the very small population, it must be something in each individual that they can work more than us. So one Irish individual got more productivity if we compare to the, the one in, in Vietnam. So their productivity is over there, more than Norway, more than Germany. And also, they remain the most productive country on earth based on the GDP that they generate. So again, the word is productivity. So the next question to me actually is uh, how, how they can have those productivities and how Vietnamese can learn from that. Because I do believe that Vietnamese got good his history of uh, you know, um, produce really great productivity. Look at the Dien Binh Phu, for example, right? Huge pro uh, uh, productivity. But, but now, how can we apply it into our world, into startup world, into VC world? We see that our time here is actually is, is a really different time compared to uh, you know, many years ago. So our time is from um, 2010, 2020, we can create a product, a startup with less price. Okay, so for example, uh, before, we never know that in uh, 2010, we got like, for example, solar. We got that huge uh, money cost that we invest in solar uh, panel. So it's unlikely that we, we can own the, the solar panel for ourselves. But now the price dropped down really much. So even our neighbor got the solar power over there. And many people in Vietnam can afford the solar power. So just one example uh, there. So I do believe that the startup creation now is really different from 10 years ago. We can create high value company with less price, with less cost. That's the very important things. And it's also been in the, the game of startup is totally different. And VC is a significant force for ha a healthy startup ecosystem. Why? Because only VC accept such kind of risk. The bank will not, right? The bank will not lend you the money. The PE will check for your access. There's no access in two founders in coffee house talking together with ideas, crazy ideas, no access in that. So VC is the one that take those risks. But they also get their science to protect their situation, right? Uh, so I think Demot here can share a lot about how he can protect. And also in the book, you can see a lot of that. But VC is really important. We look at the ecosystem here, Vietnam, 1.5 billion. Is that the big uh, VC ecosystem? Absolutely no, right? And also we, we need to see that not so many home grow VC that we have here in Vietnam. Many of them is in Singapore, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, so the VC industry here is still nascent. It's a lot of things that, that we need to uh, keep in mind. And as funding is a blood of startup, as long as you still have the funding, the company is still survive. Other than that, no, no way, right? The founders will return to the company. Um, and also, they, they need to uh, provide to their family, right? So it's unlikely that one startup without funding can survive. And I believe that in our world, in my world, in VC world, and also in startup world, understanding the VC is the best way. And it's also how to, produ uh, how to produce the productivity. It's actually through this one. So all kind of uh, logical trends of thought bring me to the ideas of I need to translate something into Vietnamese 
and it should be some some something from uh, the the partner that I know for a long time and the one that really admire. And I have read a lot of book uh, about VC because my job is like that. It, it include the uh, business of venture capital, include the venture deals. Uh, by also a friend in, in uh, America, but I recognize that this book is a kind of is combined of science and art of VC, and VC is like that. So the best way to produce the best productivity for startup in Vietnam is actually understand the VC first. And hopefully you got the funding and you got the funding, you can run your company better. I believe that a lot of entrepreneurs in Vietnam is really, really smart. And they know how to run the company. They know how to get the customer. But the VC game is really different. As no productivity as a whole if we do not know about how the VC game works. Many know about the, the uh, some, some talk about VC, some uh, general things about VC. Like they like to take risks, they like to, uh, to invest without taking the equity, a lot of things like that. But what is the real game? What is the real math? And what is the, uh, the thing that the VC never told us? It is something that I really want to, to win. And this is a, the, the opportunity of this book. And uh, Jim Buckery, like he say, um, uh, he's a, a partner of Delta Partner. And the book is uh, 15 years ago. The book is back in that time. And uh, he invested in uh, uh, 120 investment with the exit of uh, 1.8 million. It's more than the asset that committed into the VC world in Vietnam. So this is a book back then. This is the book now when we try to bring it into Vietnamese. And why now? I believe that it's, uh, it's not too late when I start this book now, because the, the, the ecosystem is still nascent. Many people, especially the Gen Z founders, the ones that take care of the ecosystem, uh, still there. And they still need to, to know about those, those secrets and those uh, uh, black art especially the uh, evaluation startup is, to me, is really black art. Uh, black art. And uh, uh, it's not too late and it's not too early. Why is not too early? Because I, I do believe that um, back then, long, long time ago, uh, when the startup is, uh, there's no ecosystem. Like uh, you can remember the time of um, Nhóm Mua, uh, you can remember the time of, uh, you know, um, early stage of uh, Tiki, there's no concept of VC then. Many, uh, many startups come to see American Capital and re receive the, uh, the no, complete no, because uh, you know, they, they, they're not really VC. But now you can see that American Capital is more into those, those things, Antebell, things like that. So I do believe that uh, it's not too early. It seems to be the right time. Vietnam is actually Ireland 15 years ago. And I wonder if we have tried we have Work Human. We have uh, many other companies like Ireland before. I don't know, but back in my, my background, it's the best that I can do for my country. And today challenges. This is the last part of my sharing, but it's really update. Our challenge now is like global quarterly funding is go drop down really much. If you look at this, it's, uh, uh, it's not something that happened without any reason. It's got a lot of reason um, like this. Because, um, for example, the, the industry of um, uh, American VC is um, uh, going big and then it boosts like uh, a bubble all the time. And we got a kind of uh, the peak of the bu bubble like um, uh, two years ago when there's a lot of crypto fund, a lot of easy money that flow into the crypto world. And now when it boosts, it leads to this kind of situation. I don't know how long it is, but definitely it's now. And if we look at the venture funding and use, it's continued to fall. From the peak of it, like uh, 2000, uh, 2020, 21, it's on the peak and then it's going down. And many VC that I talked to, uh, including the, the latest one is um, uh, the firing partner of Monsieur Venture. And 
he also say that it's uh, unlikely that we find more use in this compared to two years ago. We need to keep our dry powder. We need cash now and wait. And also now we look for fundamentals. We look for fundamental economics. It's not vision anymore. It's more about economics. And look at this. <clears throat> we can see that our situation is now the public market is like here, yeah, a lot of correction. Zoom, we work, wrap, got there, correction after IPO. And uh, we see a lot of fund, for example, Sequoia Capital, they cut the crypto fund. And founder funds also cut their eight fund a half. So I do believe that is the sentiment out of the fin uh, financial market. Less people try to put money into risky money. <clears throat> they want to keep money in some other form, especially cash, for example. Everybody wait and see. Everybody in, in threat. So that's something that we can see. But there's some sign that market company, uh, VC fund, top 20% in the world who got the good track record can also uh, can raise funds. And profitable startup is where, is where uh, people invest in. And at least they got you know, clear way to get into profitable situation. AI, <clears throat> generative AI is an exception. So AI is still there. I don't know, maybe it's the, the bubble, but you know, uh, every day we stay here in this office, we see a lot of AI startup, at least for now. And even though it's just normal startup, but they need to, they always keep their, their name with AI. I don't know why, but you know, it, it shows some numbers here. And we look at the rise and fall of WeWork. This, they used to be legendary, right? 19, they're over there. And now, they, they're not half a billion. They used to be uh, uh, what we call a decacorn, bigger than unicorn. But now they just half a unicorn, two legs. So I believe that there's something that we call the market correction. It's a time we need to get back to fundamental. And the book actually is in fundamental. And this is our threat, the threat of our world. You recognize Elizabeth Holmes, Theranos, FTX. It's a threat for VC. I believe that careless VC, because they do no due diligence. They throw easy money, and they're afraid of missing out. So I do believe that there's something that we need to uh, fight again. How can we e eliminate those kind of threat into our world? Knowledge. I believe only knowledge, only a knowledge can bring to us, only discipline. When we can do DD, when we can do due diligence, at the top of its discipline with knowledge, we can erase those cases. As long as we have those cases in the industry, there's no way investor put money into our fund. And then there's no VC industry anymore. So it's a time for us to get back to economic fundamental and use our discipline to eliminate those cases. That, that's what I really, really believe. And uh, one update here is um, the, for, for the first time, because of uh, these two people and many other like, like them, SEC need to release new rules on VC. Because the VC is a mess now. <clears throat> they release new rules based on four things, accountability, transparency, fairness, and ethics. It changed the VC world forever, I do believe. And this is, uh, you know, the, the new is just a couple of weeks ago. So what SEC do in terms of uh, the part here? This, uh, uh, they raised the right for LP, the investor in VC. They raised the right for them. LP can sue, LP can protect themselves because they have a lot of VC that use LP money without any discipline, put money into, you know, stupid you. Transparency, VC needs to disclose the activities. Back then in Europe, we always do audit, quarterly audit in-house, and annual audit by B4 or you know, auditing companies. So uh, that's something that, that we do all, all the time. 
But in Southeast Asia, I, I do believe that not many VC firms do audit them. And also some firm in, in the US also. So now it's compulsory to do those things. Other than it's cost you more, it's got the VC firm more, but it's protect the LP and it's make the game more mainstream. Fairness, before <clears throat> you believe that uh, when I raise 100 million fund, I meet a lot of LP and the practices is that I can offer side letter for particular VC. For example, you put 5 million into my fund, uh, I got a side letter for you. But another guy put 20 million. I got a different side letter for him because he put more money. But now for ADC, no special deals. It will change the VC world forever. There's no threshold, no gain, you know, uh, like um, uh, key things, side letters for the LP that put more money. So everybody is the same. So it changed the VC world all the time because I believe that it's uh, lead to the opportunity for young fund managers. Because now it is not just about side letter, about how you are smart at doing deals. It's more about your key opportunity and also your pipeline and also your uh, intelligence. So I do believe that it will change a lot. And the last thing is that uh, uh, fiduciary uh, duties is also remain the very important things. It's a duty that you cannot lose the money of your investor is emphasize, remain the same. So is it time to return to our fundamental, I believe? And this is fundamental. And translating it into Vietnamese is to introduce the fundamental things into the Vietnamese ecosystem. Again, I do believe it's a, the, the good thing to do because uh, for Vietnam now, there's no standard yet. But in Indonesia, it's really different. In Indonesia, there's uh, like a mess now because they bet very much into the high valuation. And now for many Indonesian VC that I talk to, they say that there's, they don't need startup anymore. Startup is there outside. They need scale up. They need real company with economics fundamental. So the book is like, like this with the, uh, uh, Again, the foundation, the fundamental of the method of venture investment, how to do the financial mark, uh, map, and also the, the uh, stepping stone, uh, uh, and also the risk. I think uh, the chapter three is really important for any startup. It's 10 um, risk profile and also the, um, uh, the, the dynamics of the cash flow. I think it, it's the key thing, it's uh, chapter three. And uh, I, I think the part two is also important. And what Demot did really um, great things that he did here is at uh, chapter five, because that, that's the point of view of the VC fund. So you can see that how the VC fund function and what is the com uh, compensation, why they do this job and what they expect. So normally when you meet one GP, when they first start the, uh, uh, the, the um, conversation, it's like what stage of your startup, okay? See, Seed well, you know that we never invest in seed well. We invest in A. Thank you very much. So it's like, I, I believe that as long as we understand chapter five, easier for us to save our time, to save our effort. And chapter six is uh, uh, more as my pitch deck, everything like this. But I think it's important is uh, the, the part two uh, about the, the power of the market. <clears throat> and uh, evaluation. The black, uh, the black art, the black art of the VC world. And uh, I, I think the negotiation part is really important because uh, the term sheet is uh, the science part of VC, of startup. As long as we understand the term sheet, it's easier for us to raise funds. And many lawyers that we work with, they always say that it's the standard term. It's the standard term. But it's turned out that that term is not standard. <laughs> But it's just turned out that 10 years after today, so it's really, really painful. So, and also he got some tips on uh, this part about negotiation. And uh, I think uh, chapter 11 is also important if you got the, the co-founders and also how to pull in the option pool for that and uh, for some term sheet. So I, I uh, need to uh, emphasize that this book is uh, actually is uh, run in the master 
degree program in many Irish university. So that you see how, how it's got exercise and everything like this. And you need to read this. You need to do the exercise. You need to take exam. So it, it's more about this book. So I believe that it's a mix of textbook and stories and also advices from a, a very seasonal um, investor. <clears throat> so I think uh, it's a part for Q&A. Uh, you, you want to say some, uh, some words, Demont? Any no, correction? I, I think the, what the, uh, you started in a great place, which was a lot of people don't understand venture capital, OK? And you might say, well, why do I need to understand venture capital? I, I think you need to understand venture capital because to get money from people, you have to get inside their head and the, how they're thinking. And what I think the book helps is to people can understand how the investor is thinking, how big the market is that you need to be going after. You know, why does the investor look for different types of shares? You know, why do they want to protect themselves on the downside? And I think if you can get inside the best, the investor's head, that is the key to everything. And so I think the translation of the book into Vietnamese to make it accessible to local people to really understand how venture capitalists think is really, really useful. Because most of the things that are written about venture capital are really about war stories, about how somebody set up Uber in their garage and it grew to be a $100 billion company. Well, that's not the real world. The real world is around more basic companies getting set up where the investor has a chance of making some money. You know, it's it's much more plain vanilla, we would say in English. Can you help with the speakers? I think it's uh, uneasy for people to listen, right? It's, uh, the, the speakers have got some problem here. Um, <clears throat> I got one question for you, actually, uh, Demot. Yep. The question that I always ask VC, especially founding partners, G, uh, GP also, is that what is the risk, riskiest thing that you ever done? You mean other than getting married? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> which is definitely the riskiest thing any of us can ever do. So, um, well, look. I will talk about kind of the hardest part of any investor's job, okay? Every investor makes an investment and it's the most exciting investment that they've ever made, okay? Because you wouldn't do the investment unless you're very excited about it. The problem is 18 months later, the company, all of our companies underperform, okay? They don't reach their milestones. They don't achieve the goals that they wanted to achieve. 100% of them do not achieve their goals. And that's what we expect. But the hardest part of the job is, do you actually invest more money? So let's assume you've invested one or two million or three million into something, and it's not really working out. The hardest decision and the riskiest decision is, do you invest more money? And that's where the really hard part in the venture capitalist job, in the venture capitalist job comes in. And the reason I say it's hard is because your companies become like your children. You know, you're emotionally attached to them because you really like the founders. You really believe in their story, but yet things are a bit slow. But the riskiest part of any venture capitalist job is, do I give them more money? And those are the very, very hard decisions. And sometimes we've got that right. And we've invested two more million. And on top of three million, but sometimes you know it work it doesn't work out. And when we invest more money and we lose, well, that's the worst of all because then we've doubled our bets and we've lost out. Mm. Can you hear me clearly? I I got some feedback there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we uh, we we got that ideas and uh, that that's very important things to think about and. Um, yeah, in, uh, in my um, uh, conversation with many VC, I always ask that uh, question. It's also an um, ice-breaking question, and a lot of people got m many crazy ideas around that. And uh, all of them is not about investment in startup, everything. It's uh, more about the style 
of the people that work in, in the VC industry. And uh, also taking risks is, uh, is a thing that um, uh, we see at the style of, of uh, the, the VC industry. It is, uh, can compare to many other fund managers. Uh, back in the uh, VC industry and VC ecosystem now, globally, you got any comments on, on those? Yeah, um, the, sh the chart you showed paints a very, very negative picture, Tian, okay, which is the collapse in money going into the sector, okay? Well, the other side of that story is uh, we're, we're counter-cyclical investors by nature, so that we are viewing right now in 2023 as the best time ever to invest, okay? Two years ago, you showed the slide that um, the the money was, you know, the money had uh, gone up into the sector enormously. And then your slide showed that the, the numbers went down um, a lot. Well, now is a great time to invest because the valuations that we're paying are probably half or a third of what we would have paid on a company two years ago. Entrepreneurs, they don't have five offers from five different venture capitalists. They're really happy to get our money. So it's just much, much easier to work with people in the current environment. So we're extraordinarily, I know that that's what people say, but we genuinely are trying to make more investments than we've ever made. We've made 11 investments in the last year, and we'd love to do another four by the end of 2023. So we view 2023, 2024 as the best time to lay down bets. Because don't forget, our mm -hmm. bets come to fruition in 2029 and 2030 when we know that the environment will be very different than today. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, there's a schooner talk uh, like that. And also uh, people believe that it's, um, uh, it's the correction time. So the people, uh, the companies, the shitty company got eliminated. They do something else. So yeah. at the time for us to see, yeah. Actually, one other observation I'd make, Tien, that we've seen over the last two or three years, the average age of the founders, uh, I don't, and I don't know why this is, but the average age of the founders has gone down by about 10 years mm. over the past um, three, four, five years, which we see as a very, very positive development. We have backed a number of people in their 20s, which, mm. to be very honest, would have been very unusual in the past. Prior to this, our youngest entrepreneurs would be 30, early 30s. But now we've invested in people who are straight out of college, which is quite quite scary, but really interesting. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about age, what do you think about uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the trend of um, um, young uh, fund managers, first-time fund managers out there? Well, clearly... Do you I'm see that... Clearly, I'm not 25 anymore, TN. Okay, so um, I think, well, maybe I'm just conservative, but I think people need to have experience. Okay, yeah. So mm. they need to have diverse experiences in life. And mm. um, maybe really young fund managers will turn out to be a good thing. I, I'm just a little bit cautious. Mm. There's a lot of them. Um, you learn things the hard way in business. I, I've lost, I've made lots of investments and lost money. And it's professionally embarrassing. You know, it's very hard to explain to our limited partners. We put 2 million into company X and it's gone. It's 100% mm. gone a year or two later. So I, I think mm. one needs some experience to be a venture capitalist. Um, I don't know what that experience needs to be. Maybe a bit entrepreneurial, a bit financial a bit business-like, maybe a diverse set of experiences. But I don't know, maybe I'll be proven wrong in the next few years and really great. As the entrepreneurs get younger, the venture capitalists will get younger. I think that's a good possibility, so. Mm, I see, I see. Um, and the, another question is that um, if you can compare to the VC industry back in your time, back in the, the first time you make investment, uh, back in the, the peak, uh, time that you make a lot of money from your fund. What do you think if you compare to today's industry? Um, it's actually a bit easier to invest today than it was. Look, I've been in the business for 20 years, okay? Mm -hmm. And so 
going back 20 years, every bet that we made was probably for three or four million dollars. Okay. So to start a company, just to get it going, it required three or four million dollars. So so we made very a very small number of bets, but they were quite big. Okay. Whereas today, most of the seed investments that we're making are less than one million dollars or one million euro, which is nearly the same thing. Okay. So we are making lots more bets and then only following the winners. Whereas in the past, we made a small number of bets and we probably followed most of our bets. But now we make many more bets, but we then focus in on the best of those. So for it's great to be an investor in the current environment because we can make lots of investments, but then only follow the best ones, you know, as opposed to only doing a very, very small number of investments where we've done huge amounts of due diligence on them. So I, I think the great thing about being an entrepreneur today is you can get going with less than half a million to a million euro or dollars and really mm-hmm. see, really test out your proposition to some extent and then raise a lot more money over time. Uh, yeah, what, one um, comments for the team. Is, is there any screen that uh, the mod can see the audiences here? I, I can see the audience now, yes. Yeah, yeah. Or you can put it on the stage, I believe, because I, I think the audience is, is more important. The bot and I got a lot of conversations, so we don't need to see each other quite a lot. I think yep, so. That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect now. Okay. Uh, another question of mine actually is uh, uh, the book is uh, many years ago. If yeah. today, you think of something that uh, you you need to change or improve in the book? Is there anything? Is there any yeah, part? I think what I just talked about has, has changed mm-hmm. a lot over the years, which is with the average size of the investment, as it goes mm-hmm. down, investors are making more investments. Okay, but it changes what you guys should be thinking about as entrepreneurs because people are going to give you relatively small amounts of money, even though it sounds like a lot of money, which is a million dollars or a million euro, they will be really focused in on not can you build a big business with this, but what are you going to do in the next 18 months with that money? Mm-hmm. How do you achieve some must? Are you going to capture 25 customers? Are you going to see how expensive it is to acquire those customers? Are you going to test your product out with 20 companies? So the emphasis now is, as I, which was different to when I wrote the book, was now it's smaller bets, more bets, mm-hmm. cancelling more bets as well. So from the entrepreneur's perspective, um, maybe the investors are a little bit less committed to their business than they would have been in the past because we're making mm-hmm. lots of investments. Does that make mm-hmm. some sense? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we got uh, that clear train of thought. Um, I, I think this uh, question is really a um, uh, popular question, actually, is uh, your recommendation, just one top recommendation for uh, the entrepreneurs globally. Um, ooh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a general, that's a very, very general question. Yeah. Um, I think the greatest, genuinely now, there, there's a kind of a view in venture capital that other than artificial, that the whole future is all about artificial intelligence, okay? I have a view that there is, we are only at the very start of the opportunity, say that the internet has created. And so I think there are many, 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 many more opportunities today than there were in the past. If, if I was 20 or 30 years younger, um, I think it would be a great time. It's a fabulous time to be setting up a company, guys. It's a... There is not a lot of money available, but hopefully with a limited amount of money, you can make as much progress as you possibly can. But I know that by 2024, 2025, the VC market, as you said earlier, Kian, is very cyclical and it'll be a super time to be raising larger amounts of money um, by by that mm-hmm. point. So I, I think the opportunities in the world are only getting going as opposed to behind us. I see. Um, um... Given the, the time, your connection, and also your time working in the US and also in Europe, 
what you see the difference between the, the two VC industry and startup industry? Yeah, un unfortunately, the, the US, what the US is really great at, guys, is if something works, they, the market in the US is enormous, as you all know. It's three or 400 million mm -hmm. people, and they're very wealthy. Mm -hmm. So the, what the US does really well, and we struggle with in Europe, is backing the winners. So if something mm -hmm. is working in the US, if they're able to get customers at a good price, if they've built mm -hmm. the technology, those companies, you know, you quickly read about rounds of venture capital of 10, 20, 30 million dollars to really accelerate those companies. So, you know, Europe is slowly, is slowly maybe catching up with the US, but the amount of money that the American venture capitalists can put, can put into the companies there um, is great. I suppose one of the matches you guys have in Vietnam compared to Ireland is our home market is 5 million people. Your mm -hmm. home market is nearly 100 million people mm. so at least within a very familiar environment if somebody decides to set up a, a business uh, i don't know selling teddy bears mm. online and um, you can build a big business in potentially mm. in vietnam in a very familiar environment which is not open to us in ireland or in europe mm. most of the countries are, 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 are in general are too small mm. i see i see yeah uh, there's uh, actually the, the point of view of uh, the very um, experienced VC in um, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, he see that um, uh, for the US, actually is um, uh, more about product market fit problem. Build new things, try to find the product market fit, and then grow dramatically. For Southeast Asia, in his point of view, actually is uh, more about finding efficiency. Uh, okay. Don't talk about um, pro product market fit anymore. You need to try to find some market that already there and unserved with technology, and serve that market with uh, with technology, other than just uh, find new ideas and uh, things like that. Uh, I believe there's a kind of trend support, and uh, that guy I believe that is uh, really important for Southeast Asia uh, companies to go that way, other than in the U.S. So it leads to the question about innovation in terms of regional innovation. So uh, do you see that there's a difference in terms of uh, regional thinking, regional innovation, that some people in the US can be more innovative than some people in Europe or some people in, uh, in, in third world countries? What do you think about that? No, I don't think, um, look, are they more innovative? The market is different in the everything. Look, the US is very different, guys. It's very different to Europe, and it's clearly very different mm -hmm. to Southeast Asia and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. People need to adapt the opportunities to um, to their own different market. Look, the, I, 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 there's a topic I think about a lot, which is where do opportunities come from? Mm -hmm. And um, the opportunities, and there's a whole set of opportunities around what I call for example, idle assets, okay? Like, for example, mm. I have a car that sits in my front driveway that sits there 95% of the time. Mm. You know, I have a parking space in front of my house that's empty the whole time. Mm. You know, mm. I have I have clothes that I'm wearing that I'm not using, okay, or that are in my wardrobe. There's, I have all sorts of tools and equipment for fixing things around the house that are idle 99% of the time. So there are phenomenal opportunities to capture those idle assets and make them available to other people. You know, the sharing economy, which is a term that most of you will be familiar with. Well, the sharing economy in Ireland would be very different to the sharing economy in the US, which would mm. be very different to the sharing economy in uh, Vietnam. So absolutely, mm. opportunities need to be adapted to the local market. Um, you know, maybe the next complicated high-tech you know, deep technology venture will come out of the U.S. because they're spending enormous amounts of money in their universities to develop new technologies. But there's no reason many there's no reason many other businesses, you know, whether it's you know copying venture capital models from or entrepreneurial models from the U.S. or capturing them from Europe, those can easily be adapted. But they should absolutely be adapted to the local environment. I, I don't mm -hmm. think people in any particular country are more or less entrepreneurial. It depends on the opportunities that are in front of them. Mm, 
I see. Um, I got just two more questions for you, and then it's uh, pass on to the audiences here. No um, yeah, I, I think uh, for the guy, just think about any question that you got in mind. Um, uh, the one is that, what do you think about one key trend actually in Vietnam in terms of um, adoption? And also we, we see a lot of uh, companies doing th in this sector. And also uh, there's a, at least one unicorn in Vietnam in this sector is uh, blockchain. What do you think about blockchain? I'm, we're not seeing many projects in the area, Tien, yet, okay? Mm. I've got to believe that over time, it's, you know, technologies kind of seem to become exciting for a while, and then they either die away or mm. they come back with a vengeance. <laughs> and I suspect blockchain, we're not seeing many opportunities um, mm. adapting blockchain to into financial services or other areas. I don't know if people in other countries are seeing a lot more than us. Uh, I, I mm. simply don't know. Clearly, AI is the big thing that everybody's talking about, and everybody's playing around with chat GPT and other things mm. in customer mm. services sectors and places like that. Will mm. that be the wave of the future? I suspect so, but who knows? Okay, so mm. um, areas of technology come and go overnight, you know, so. Mm. I see. Uh, the last question is uh, about um, what is the hardest thing that you see as the GP in a fund, one hardest example, one challenge that you uh, observed in the past that uh, yeah. you, you still remember now and is the hardest situation? Look, guys, raising a venture capital fund is incredibly difficult, okay, because we have to go to people and we say to them, and you'll have done the same, Tien, you yeah. know, give me money for 10 years Okay, and I'm going to invest it in all these risky companies. A bunch of them are going to go bust. And hopefully in eight or nine or 10 years after you've invested in the fund, I'm going to give you back two or three times your money. Okay, that's mm. broadly the so raising a venture capital fund is incredibly difficult for those reasons. Mm. But also because when you get into a venture capital fund, there's a phrase which say, the lemons ripen, ripen first. Now, the lemons are the things you don't want to eat. You want to eat the apple rather than the lemon. But the problem mm -hmm. is that the lemons, the bad investments happen first. Mm -hmm. So our most successful investments, we were investors there for six or seven or 10 years. But the bad investments we knew about after a year. So venture capitalists typically find that we're going back to an, our investors and apologizing because the first investments that we may go bust mm. and then it's only the good ones the good ones become clearer after six or seven or eight or nine ten years so there's a phrase in the sector called the j curve which is things go down before they go up and so you're mm. explaining all the bad investments before you're talking about the good ones that you're going mm. to make lots of money on mm. i see uh, it remind me of the, the phrase that my uh, uh, our lp in rvc that talked to us that um, it's a ridiculous game when you come here, ask me the right to use my own money and charge me every year for the management fee. It's a very ridiculous game. <laughs> so it's uneasy, uneasy, because we, we try to do the game that, that's really different. It's not the normal game. So it's the burden for the GP, for the BC. And I believe that with the uh, translation and also with the work of uh, uh, Demo on the book, we hope that we can bridge, we can bridge the mind of both way VC and, and startup in terms of this feature. Uh, yeah, I believe it's my role here is done. It's passed on to you guys. If you've got any question to Jamal please. Yeah, please, please. Uh, Hello. I'm sorry, I can't hear, I can't hear her. I pass on the microphone. You can still hear me, right? I can still hear you, Tian. Okay, so. Yeah. Well, I have a question um, uh, because I, I understand like uh, you see this is a very uh, risky business and you uh, evaluate like different business that's the early stage. So I would like to understand from your experience, uh, how, how do you look at 
people or, or like the people factor, right? Like the founders, uh, what, what kind of yeah. qualities or personalities or characteristics? Because uh, so to minimize your risk, as earlier you mentioned, like, well, the, 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 the risky, the most risky things is, <laughs> is getting married, something like that. I, so I do believe like people factors is really important. So I would like to understand more on that front. Thank you. It's it's too early in the morning to ask hard questions, you know. So, um, <laughs> I, I, um, I let me be very simple about it. Which is the first thing is you have to like the people. I know that sounds very simplistic, but you must like the people because you're going to be talking to them if the business is successful, probably every day or every week for the next ten years. Okay. So because we're in these businesses for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. So number one is if you because if you don't like them and trust them, well, then absolutely forget about it. OK, so the one thing that we really look for in our people, because as I said, some people are now 25 year old entrepreneurs who have left college in the last two or three years. So they haven't built businesses. They haven't built businesses before their first time. All, nearly everybody you invest with, we invest with our first time round entrepreneurs. So the one thing that we try to look for is, are they achievement orientated? Okay, so so to some extent, whatever they've done, have they done done it really well? And have they tried really hard? So if somebody came to us, like we've been asked to look at the business around physiotherapy, okay? Well, we would then want to say, well, is that person being one of the great physiotherapists in Ireland? OK, have they built a great clientele of, of customers, et cetera, et cetera. So what, whatever they've done, we want them to be very achievement orientated because those are the people who, when the things are getting tough, they'll put their head down and they'll really stick at it and try to make it happen. So so really, we have to like the people. And then I suppose the other thing is, are they achievement orientated? Very few people are experts have previously been experts in the area that we've invested in. So there's a trend towards people who have not worked in the sectors that they're tar that they're targeting, which is counterintuitive. Yeah, um, I think I can add something from my side. Actually, is uh, uh, we also need to DD the the people and uh, follow a model of uh, due diligence. It's more about product market fit, founder industry fit. And how our fund fit into that that business if we got enough money or anything like that. So founders is uh, include in the founder industry fit. If that guy is uh, 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 was born to run in this industry, if they got enough resilience, got enough things, and like demo say, I, I totally agree is that how uh, if, what we think about that guy, can we get along with him, his team for a long time? And was, there's some story about uh, one story about the, the company that we invested in uh, Singapore. Um, we got some bad news about that guy in terms of that guy is so nice. He's really nice. He's totally just a technology guy. He's done technology very well, but he's not a sales person. So he cannot sell. He cannot go and talk bullshit about a lot of things and also try to sell a lot of things. But he's a nice guy. So, and from our point of view, we just see that we fit with that guy. We like somebody, nice guy like that. And we can find some sale force, uh, sale people later, replace the CEO maybe. But, you know, it's uh, some guy like that is the one that we like. The one that nice enough, good at technology. Is, that's just enough. So I think one key thing is that how the people fit into the game. Yeah, I believe so. Actually, one, more one observation yeah, yeah, I could make it. Tian, which is, I see the audience is probably about 50% men and 50% women. Um, there's an enormous emphasis on female entrepreneurship today. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we're under good pressure to mm -hmm. make sure that we allocate a good high percentage of our fund to female entrepreneurs. So it's become a real priority for the sector, I'm, I'm guessing, over the last five, six, seven years. And so all the funds will be under pressure is the wrong word, but they'd be encouraged to uh, invest with female entrepreneurs as much as possible. So there's been, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of training going on and there's a lot of trying to understand the different mm -hmm. types of businesses that females tend to set up than, than males. So I don't know if you're seeing that sort of a phenomenon over there as well. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, including in the the VC industry, uh, right here wow. in this building, we also got some events with the uh, uh, women in VC, yeah, things like that. So it's a real trend, and I must say that uh, I cannot understand women well. So, uh, but but we got people in the team that understand, and we need to have those people, <laughs> yeah, because uh, they really they they really different, uh, and also can bring a lot of value on the table. I must say so. Yeah, it's, it's not the time for you know uh, male games anymore. Yeah. A any more question? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I have question for all you guys because uh, I think VC business is have new in most people in Vietnam. So I'm also I'm also uh, this you know, this concept is new for me. So, so I just think about investor. Investor, some in, in Vietnam they have a lot of money. But they care about how to invest, mostly invest in real estate or these public companies. So I want to know how in, the investor can invest in which we see and how they uh, they know you guys value the companies. Because these public companies, they have everything, financial report, the information about the companies. But startup, it has to be uh, values. The whole guy, what's most factor that you guys value a uh, startup companies? And to be just from from investor. I I couldn't hear the question there, Tian. Could you could you repeat it for me, Tian, please? Yes, it's about um, evaluation. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, what, what is the the method of uh, evaluation and uh, what thing about valuation? Uh, yeah. So um, I think it's more about the method of uh, evaluation because uh, he compared to the uh, public companies, they got enough information like that. But startup, there's no history, a lot of things. So um, I, I believe that uh, evaluation. Yeah. So e e evaluation or valuation, Tian? Yeah, how we evaluate the startup. Oh, oh okay, okay. So do you, do you want to talk or do you would you like me to talk? Yeah, I, I think you more origin. No problem. Yeah, so please. how we operate, guys, is let's assume of the looks like there's about 20 of you there. So five of you, you know, want to meet want to meet us because you're interested in raising money. So the way that we work is we are we're business people. We're actually not technology specialists. We are at the end of the day, we are business people. So we typically I'll give you the process. We sit down with you for an hour and we talk it through. We actually have open diaries so that if you want to come in and talk to me, you can book a time on my calendar. OK, so we want to talk to entrepreneurs whenever they're ready. So you you could from Vietnam, if you want to talk to me about your business, you can book half an hour on my on our website to talk to me or one of my partners. OK, so we want to be incredibly open to people with opportunities. Now, if it's of no interest to us, you know, because you're focusing on something that we don't we that doesn't fit with us we'll tell you straight away but if we are interested we then very quickly arrange a meetings with people where we go through a pitch and um, typically we ask them to let's assume we continue being interest interested we will ask you to introduce us to people who understand the opportunity or the area that you're targeting so for example if you were looking at, um, at a buying and selling property just we would ask you to introduce us to people who would use the service that you are planning to set up. Even if you haven't got any customers today, we'd ask you to talk to prospects. And then over, so over a period of four to six weeks, we probably form a view and you meet our partners as to whether we want to do this or not. And if we do, we put down a term sheet, what's called a term sheet. So most of you will be familiar with that, which just lists out the way that we want to make the investment. And then it takes about a month or two to get the legal documents sorted out. It just takes more time than it should. So, so it's probably in terms of the process of evaluation in total probably takes about eight to 10 weeks. Unless we're really interested, in which case we move much, much faster. So, so I, I think it's um, uh, maybe we can make an example of, uh, for example, I, I believe that one key question of the people here is that, um, uh, for example, one startup in uh, um, generative AI, in uh, Serie A, for example, how come the investor can got the valuation of like uh, 10 million free money or something like that? Yeah. 
So I, I believe that the the process, the, the process of uh, how we come up with the the particular number for one startup. Uh, oh, oh, that's a really really hard question. So, um, can I make a, a funny answer, which is the answer for us is probably if three to four million. Okay, so given the amounts of money we're investing, which might be up to a million in a startup, we will typically want to own twenty to twenty five percent. So for putting up a million and buying 25%, let's call the valuation 4 million. That's a really tip for a startup valuation. That's that's typically what we would expect to be paying. If you came to us, two or three of you with a PowerPoint and you're just getting going, we will put a valuation on, on the business of probably 3 million or something, something along those lines. I know that sounds incredibly unscientific, but that's the way that the, the market, and in the US it's probably four to $5 million. I have no idea, obviously, in Vietnam or Southeast Asia. But typically, the seed investors putting up a million or the pre-seed investors and they're buying 20% or 25% or something like that. It's a, it's a bit more scientific than that, but um, that's the basics. I don't know, yeah, yeah. Jan, if it's much different for you. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, normally we work backwards. What, what we need, what we need in terms of exiting from your company and uh, uh, one key thing is that we need to return the fund. So like I managed 10, uh, 100 million, I need your company to bring me 100 million. We work backward, like after many stage, you need to go like that, something. And uh, I, I think I can add one more thing is that we need to look at the, the, the market, uh, the market of uh, startup uh, evaluation. Uh, so it's like um, these day, like two years ago, I usually met with some uh, startup in Indonesia, seed round with uh, pre-money 100 million. So that's crazy. That's crazy. Even though there, there's a lot of people agree with that uh, investment, but because they do not work backward, so they they don't they just put the money in, but it's unlikely that they can take the money out because uh, uh, the valuation at the beginning is really really high. And how can you return the fund? If that, uh, how can you return the fund? That company needs to be billion billions. So I, I do believe that working backwards and look at the the standard, the benchmark of the uh, the market is really important. Is really important. Uh, uh, nowadays, like EarthVC, we also use some some uh, technological tool to see the valuation outside and compare many other views. But uh, that two years, the last two years, really crazy. A lot of valuation is really um, uh, crazy valuation, but now you know it's a correction. So uh, I believe that this uh, the valuation now is uh, easier and it's a time to view the time to invest now. Yeah, like like the most. Any question else, guy? Or if you uh, try to find out more things, just tell us. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, thank uh, Mr. Bakery to for joining us today. So I just want no to problem. ask from your experience, um, why is the largest uh, ticket side that you have invested before, and some background on that? Like, what? How do you feel? Like, what is the process, and if the outcome is is there? Yeah. Uh, so the largest um, in we we will we the largest investment that we've ever made is seven million dollars in the company yeah. over its life. And we used to invest in medical devices. So, and those are very complicated and they require a lot of money. So probably that company raised 13 million from different people over its life, over multiple rounds. Um, but it was a very successful company and it sold to Johnson and Johnson, which is a company most of you will know, I think. And it sold to Johnson and Johnson for over $300 million. So, um, so there was a good return on. We call that return on like how much money went in versus how much money came out. Obviously, management made a lot of money as well. So that would be the largest exit that we would have had. It was probably one of our largest investments and one of our largest exits. So hopefully that answers your question. So it was a device, if you're familiar with the, a stroke, if so elderly people have a stroke. I don't know what the equivalent word is in Vietnamese. But it's a blockage in the brain, and it's a a device for removing the blockage from the brain. So, mm. 
All right. So from that question, you you can uh, learn how how much money he gains from the business. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question, uh -huh. please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, can you explain for me a bit about uh, startups and businesses? Like, uh, I don't know the real difference between uh, uh, making a startup and making one's own business, like from from zero. Uh, so uh, that I think that will make a difference be because uh, it will determine how uh, an entrepreneur should uh, look for investments or not. Can you explain it uh, for me a bit? Yeah. Thank you. Um... I, I'll try to answer that question. So probably of, of 100 businesses that are set up by people, probably only 1% or 2% are relevant for venture capital. So venture capital is relevant for businesses where a bunch of money needs to go in to accelerate things before you're going to get revenues. So for most businesses, hopefully the revenues come quickly and the entrepreneur can fund it by themselves or with their family or by borrowing money from the bank. But if you need to put money into building a product, like if it requires some number of millions to build a product and to start your early customer engagement, well, that's when venture capital is suitable. And so venture, like Tian and people like us, we want to make 10 times our money or more on an investment. So unless you're getting into the type of business that has the chance of yielding that sort of, which is a crazy return, giving people 10 times their money back. And, um, you know, invest, you don't take outside investors on board unless you can give them a big return on their money, because otherwise they will end up unhappy and you'll have unhappy shareholders um, in, in your company. So hopefully that, so the vast majority of new businesses set up in the world are obviously not venture capital back because they, they don't need a, a big, pile of money put into them to jumpstart the business and they don't have the opportunity to give the returns to the investors. Is that yeah, I think one, yeah, uh, one key things about the um, VC industry is that we manage one of the top expensive money in the world. So our money, we need to guarantee, uh, you know, to the, the investor uh, fiduciary duty to our LP. So that's important to us to, uh, you know, use the money with a, a very expensive cost. So uh, because of that cost, so we need to gain it as fast as possible. Like for a particular fund, it's just like 10 years. And within that 10 year, we need to return the fund things. So uh, there's one startup. Um, actually, there's a, a few startup uh, before that uh, come to me with the cash flow uh, like this for 20 years. For 20 years, it's go like this. And, you know, just, uh, I believe it's a BOT project. It's not the startup. It's just go like this. And it's for the government, for infrastructure. It's not for, for the people like, like VC. People like VC, they look for hockey stick. It's going up on the way. And like uh, Demo say, hockey stick can bring like 10, 10x something. It's crazy. It's crazy, uh, you know, the return on investment. So uh, I do believe that it is also set some uh, uh, thought for us in terms of before we approach the VC, we know what is the expectation of VC. If we cannot scale, cannot make the hockey stick things, we just go like normal uh, uh, business. It's not the business of VC. Any question else? Yeah, please. You write at the camera. I actually got a question for you. Okay. Yes. Um, I enjoyed your last uh, like um, seminar in uh, the end of August, and you shared that the average age of uh, GD is around 49 or 59. And I really wonder that you know, what it takes for you to uh, become such a young GD at your, at your age. I'm really <laughs> curious. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Luck, I believe. Luck. It, it was lucky. My, my luck actually is uh, get to know uh, Demod Bakri and learn from him uh, a lot. Uh, learn from other people in, in Ireland. 
it's lucky because uh, in Ireland is the, the country for uh, uh, investment, for investment fund. It, it's a kind of tax haven. I don't know uh, how it is now, but, but uh, you know, it's also the way that people domicile the, their fund. So easy to, to see a lot of uh, fund manager there, learn from them. And as the most say in his book, it's like it takes at least five years and five million lost to get a good fund managers. I think it's uh, the key things in the book. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 a, a lot of us. Uh, how, how much that I lost? <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's a lot, man. <laughs> it's a sad story. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, it's a lot, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, the gain can compensate the whole thing. So at least we bet on the right startup. So uh, in here, I, I think I need to put in uh, uh, fundamental things again. There's four things that the VC world based on. First of all, is a uh, value. It's just part of the process. Normal startup, uh, normal VC, um, they believe on that. Value is part of the process. So uh, if you see that value is uh, you know, really significant, you cannot get overcome it. Is uh, just normal investor. The second thing is that it's a heat-driven business. So we just find some heat on our portfolio. And also it's a pre-market for talent. Talent can go anywhere. They can file their, their, their startup. They can, file, they, they can look for money anywhere. So we need to believe in that. They can leave the com uh, company by opportunity, a lot of things. And uh, equity sharing is a lot of things that I believe that is a principle uh, of the VC world. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, the, the principles like that, uh, you want to add anything, uh, Demote? No, I think that's that's actually a great summary of it. So it's the one thing about guys, you end up, the, your entrepreneurs and your venture capitalists ends up becoming good friends most of the time. So most of the time, sometimes there's disputes, but probably 80% of the time you, you've dealt with these people in stressful situations. So it's it's great to have a sharing structure that like Tien talked about there where we benefit and you benefit if things are successful. That's the goal, rather than conflict, that it's all harmonious. Yeah, uh, and I think um, GP uh, getting younger and younger uh, and riskier, they, they're riskier. And uh, I, I think it's also because uh, the history of VC is just uh, around 60 years. And now is a time for the entrepreneurs when they exited and got some money they put those money into the fund. They want to raise the fund uh, and also manage it. I think it's, it's the time for, for VC. And uh, also um, emerging, emerging fund managers is out there. But for Vietnam, it's a different case. There's not many emerging fund managers here. So it's likely that many uh, investors want to invest in Vietnam. They don't know what kind of safe hand they can you know, uh, believe in. So uh, uh, I, I believe that we translate in the book. Uh, I do hope that we, we can bring more ideas and um, and put more you, you know effort into the, the next generation of fund manager in Vietnam. Uh, okay, um, I need to check the time. How 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 much time did we got left? Oh, what happened there? Very old school. <laughs> how how much? Uh, how how many questions? That maybe three questions. Okay, done in a half. Yeah. You're still there, right? Okay. Um, there's some technical problem here. No problem. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Perfectly. Okay. So, um, um, any more question, guys? I have no question. Yeah, please. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, Robert and uh, Anbin for this uh, sharing session. Um, so I think, uh, I believe that um, we uh, we have so many young um, ladies and gentlemen here working in uh, VCs. And uh, I was so um, motivated 
uh, yet um, at the same time, uh, pretty much probably some when you said that uh, the young early um, VC GPs will have a lot of uh, struggles when they have uh, little experience. So can you share some of the experience, the common early mistakes that we may get uh, at the beginning uh, in our journey? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The youth may get them sometimes. What What do you think, Demote? Um, I, I, the question I think you asked, uh, just to be clear, was um, for young GPs, um, how do they? Uh, what are the struggles that they in particular are going to face? Was that your? I just the audio wasn't great. Was that your question? I don't think it's a uh, more gossip in this question. This is more about uh, your your young age. What uh, What is the the mistake that you remember in your young age? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's. I think this. This. I'll answer the same question, which is, when you when you get into the investment business, you're dying to you're dying to make investments. Okay. So, you know, because it, it the business is. It, you're a bit like a salesperson who wants to sell money to somebody. You're dying to make investments, and everything looks interesting. And so, um, we recently hired two new partners. And my advice to them was slow down and just take it easy because um, it's very, very, it's incredibly easy to make investments. It's incredibly hard to get any money back out of those investments. So my only bit of advice to either younger entrepreneurs, but more importantly, younger venture capitalists, people who just get into the business is um, slow down. It's easy to give money to people and it's very painful when those investments go bad. It's incredibly painful because the first two investments that I did when I joined this company that I'm with now, we lost 100% of our money. And one of them was for 3 million euro, which is a lot of money. So, and I assure you, it's very hard to explain to your investors why your first two investments have been terrible. So, um, you learn a lot very quickly. And so slow down and take it easy. There's no hurry to make investments. That's kind of my bit of advice, if I've understood your question correctly. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. It's um, uh, it's also remind me of um, the um, uh, chief investment officer of uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation. Uh, they see arm of World Bank and uh, one of the key uh, LP in the VC world. Uh, normally, they commit like twenty percent of any fund that you raise. Uh, and uh, his comment is that it's hard to find fund managers with discipline today because everybody is so formal. Everybody chasing something and, uh, you know, it's uneasy for you to, you know, be disciplined based on that. So I think one of the key words mm -hmm. for fund managers now is about discipline. And, uh, you know, it's really hard because uh, with discipline, you need to pay for a lawyer, you need to pay for a lot of people, you need to do DJ a lot of time, and you need to, uh, you know, uh, stay up late every night to look for, uh, to, to um, look at your term sheet, everything. So discipline. And again, I totally agree that investment is not easy. Investment, when the time that you release the money is easy. It's fun, <laughs> but then it's uneasy to exit. Anybody that buy with that price, yeah, it's a really tricky game. Yeah, yeah, please. Hello, uh, thank you for your attend today. I think uh, I have a question. Not uh, I interest not only in VC but VS as well, venture studio. And can you point out some differences between the VC and VS, and what is the challenges? for the VS as well, and how to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The differences between... Okay, so you came across with uh, venture capital in uh, in Europe, do you? Uh, I'm in venture studio, venture builder things. No, sorry, could you just, um, could you explain the term to me? We, we have all sorts of models here. What do you mean exactly by venture studio? 
Yeah, as a kind of uh, venture builders, like if you make example, Rocket Internet, is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. understand. Yeah, so I, the I'm difference is... Yeah. I'm not a particular believer in the model. So, um, you know, entrepreneurs need to set up their business and make it happen. And having other people, outsiders, we want the company to be owned by the entrepreneurs and the investors, as opposed to, I, I recently looked at a venture studio type opportunity where the venture studio wanted 50 to 60% of the business, you know, and we would own maybe 20 or 25 and management would only start with 20 or 25% of the business. So I just think it sets the company off on the wrong footing if you know, if number one, the ownership is not in the business. And secondly, you know, we are backing entrepreneurs to make it happen. So, you know, I would think a venture studio might be a bit of a, a, a crutch to hold them up. So I wouldn't be particularly in favor of the model, but but everything depends. Every situation is situationally unique. So, Yeah, it's a rise in terms these days. Venture studio, startup studio, venture builder take a lot of uh, percentage in one company. Uh, institutional co-founders is also the term that uh, run by e-founders in France. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's still uh, the topic that we need to explore because VC is just 60 years of uh, history and Venture yeah. Studio is just 20 years, I believe. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. We, we try. We, we try uh, before. For LVC, we try Venture Studio here. But uh, now we focus more in VC. Yeah. Okay. Lots Any question else? Lots of people will have different views on that topic, so I, I won't claim expertise. So. Yeah, yeah. We, we're not sure. Even uh, I believe that there, there's some people with good skill, uh, like suitable skill for that. They can run a venture studio like that. But, uh, you know, normally it's uh, just in my opinion, it's the, the economics uh, uh, thing is not there because there are no incentive left for, for founders. But it's just my opinion. Yeah. Any question else, guys? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Antin, and thank you, um, sir, for uh, um, the talking today. And uh, following the previous question of the uh, the pen phone experience when we have the fail investment uh, of the visa to the startup for summer. So besides the pen phone experience and the bad moves or so many things or any other responsibility that the venture should have for the, um, the part limited partner for the investor of those uh, fail case. Yep. But we should do. Yeah, any other agreement between the, the venture, the capital venture and investor in the failed case. For example, within in the first day, so we didn't have not have the, uh, the good reputation and experience in the market. So how the, the investor trust the within to give within uh, the money to invest to the startup. If they give you money, so any agreement that you in your in the failed case that they can get some money back, or uh, how can they trust you? Yeah. So to me, uh, uh, we need to clarify that uh, question for fund managers, right? Yeah. How can we put money in fund managers? Yeah. We fail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We should do. Yeah. Uh, anybody go to jail? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, we're still here, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, Demot, please. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear the question or your answer, Tian. So, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I repeat it. it as actually, yeah. is uh, uh, her question is about the um, uh, the case that we managed the money of the LP, and then yeah. we fell on one investment. Uh, what will happen in some scenarios, and what should we do in terms of fail like that? Well, a failure is part of the business. So I mentioned the first two investments I made, we wrote off 100% of the money and it was Im incredibly embarrassing and uh, incredibly difficult to explain to people. But um, typically one third of the investments in a fund go bust, okay? 
one third do okay and then one third makes all the money so we have to explain to the investors in advance that what we call the limited partners banks and government and wealthy people we ha- we do explain to them in advance there will be losses here but the winners will make up for all the losses and more and that's always been the case all of our funds have made money um so we can demonstrate to people that with even with the losses it's worth staying with it and being patient if they're patient they will do okay if not very well but if you are but sometimes we have the wrong type of investor in the fund and they get very nervous if we lose a few investments and as i, I said see. earlier the, the bad investments become apparent really quickly you know within 6 months or a year normally so so it's a good question and um, maybe sometimes investors want to get their money back the, the rest of their money back um but the the legal documents they they are bound into providing the money so uh i think people here um there's one interesting question that people here got in my eyes that uh, is there any fund manager that go to jail <laughs> we don't want to hear about that <laughs> yeah it's a sad story but uh, i think that the lp can tell you more about that sad story and one thing is that you can read about the cases in uh, the website of edc whenever any fund manager got fined got uh, uh, to return the money or uh, go to court go to jail or something is on uh, sec you can see a lot of case study on that and uh, normally we learn from that but uh, is um, if, if you just do everything completely well with the uh, agreement what we call limited partnership agreement uh, everything within that if you've done it like with your ethic things i believe that no no problem because uh, anyway we, we cannot uh, uh, decide the market right if there's something happen if there's something happen it's not your fault not your intention i, I don't believe that there is uh, something problem. but you know they, uh, 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 you lost your reputation they will not give the money for you to manage anymore yeah Okay. Any question else, guy? I think uh, how, how many questions that we got left? Okay, two, two question. Okay, please, two question. If you got any. Okay, sure, 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 sure. It's a very interesting one. Not jail anymore. Okay. Yeah, I'm really happy that uh, no one goes to jail. Yeah. I am a startup founder myself. So, um, so in this downturn of the market, so um, you guys just uh, show us that uh, actually this is a good time to invest to the entrepreneur. Um, but I see they are really tough for the startup to get the in, in investment these day. So um, besides the the measurement that the investor invests to the startup that I see nowadays is based on the profit. So besides the profit, any any matters else that the the investor concerned about besides the profit management? So you got that? No, I, I'm sorry, I just can't hear it that clearly. But I, sorry, could you okay. could could. Absolutely. So um, uh, her question is about uh, is a down, downturn and uh, investor unlikely to invest in startup. But uh, we, we, we also see that there is the right time because the uh, valuation is um, under correction. So uh, we may got a good uh, valuation. So uh, uh, we, for this kind of situation, what we look for in terms of startup, right? Uh, if it's not profit, it's something that we see at the right side of one startup to invest in. I don't under, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Sorry, could you repeat the last part? So so you're saying, yeah. I, I just, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, so uh, in, in this downtrend, we, um, uh, you say that it's a, a right time to invest. So yeah. uh, what do you look for in uh, one startup in this particular uh, time? Excellent. Good, good. That's a great question because the bar is definitely higher, okay, because obviously two years ago it was much easier to get money and probably in most parts of the world it's harder now. I, I think for us it is um, 
with typically our seed rounds or that we're providing are about a million euro okay a million dollars <clears throat> so for us we try to sit down with the entrepreneur and say it's not it sounds like a lot of money it's not a lot of money because by the time you pay pay salaries and rent etc you know it, it uses up normally that money lasts for 18 months okay so um so we sit down and we say what are the milestones within the next 18 months that this company needs to hit so you know are they going to try to get five customers or 10 customers how much are they going to be we get very 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 specific because people sometimes think oh i'm using this money to build a business well you are but really you're trying to create evidence to give us the comfort to invest more money. So the goal for you when you're raising money today is how do you convince the investor to give you more money in a year and a half? So I think there needs to be really tight alignment between the entrepreneur and the investor to say, well, what are we trying to do with this small amount of money? The amounts of money today are smaller than they were two years ago. How do we make as much progress with a small amount of money as we could have made two years ago. So I think it's more more needs to be done with less money. That's that's what needs to happen in the current environment. And so we'll be looking for opportunities that are fast to revenues. OK, so that we will get revenues, even if they're small, we get them quickly. Whereas two years ago, we might have been happy to wait 18 months or two years for revenues. Now we will want things that can get to revenue much, much, much quicker. So. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think um, in the um, uh, uptrend situation, you can find good founders to invest. But in the downtrend, you need to find outstanding ones. Yeah. So they need to outstanding. They need to get good traction. And normally, the startup that that we invest today at RBC, uh, they got uh, uh, revenue roughly one million per year already, and they need to have paying customer already and the the solution is there it's not the question about you know building something without any uh revenue or anything but i don't know maybe in uh, the up train uh, uh, we, we need to find somebody with you know just uh uh the ideas or uh, you know pro prototype for example yeah but so far so far the the bar is higher mm. one slot Oh, one question. I hope it's a tricky one. Some tricky things, not personal things, not jail, not uh, interesting things. <laughs> right? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you. So when is the right time for an entrepreneur to approach a VC? Uh, what do you think about that? For example, if he had, if he had a uh, an MVP or uh, he has uh, he has a marginal profit or he has the other um, advantages that you can also see as well. That is a really really important question. Now, I think Tian's answer might be different to mine because he's investing in companies that have more revenues. Okay, I'm at the riskier end of the spectrum, so. So as I as I mentioned earlier, we have open calendars, okay? So and what we do is we will talk to everybody because your business and I don't know what it is, but your business might not be interesting to us today, but it could be interesting tomorrow. So we want to talk to you today and maybe help you guide you a little bit in what you're doing. And so we're very happy to talk to people who are pre-revenue, pre-product, pre-customers. We might not invest at that point, but at least we have met the person and we will, we've will we built a relationship with them that means six months later, we can maybe have a more detailed conversation when they've made more progress. So I think it's great to go and talk to investors about your ideas and tell them, I'm not ready yet to raise money but I'm I'd like to come back to you in six months or three months or nine months or whatever the case might be. And, um, but engage with the investors really early. That's my advice. Others might give you different advice, but I, I think it's great to talk to investors when you're not raising money, before you're raising money. 
and, wa and warm them up to what you're doing. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree that um, get in deep with them before you, um, uh, you need the money. Because we, we see a lot of startups that come here and uh, the question we usually ask is that, um, uh, what is, how long is your runway? And many startups, I got one month runway, I got two month runway, I would die without your money like in the next uh, three months something. So it's unlikely that we, we can invest in somebody like that. So get in touch with them, tell them, update to them. So uh, update to them, let, let them know what you do, what is the new things, you need to pivot or anything. So uh, I think your question is uh, in the two dimensions. First dimension is based on the, the situation of the market. And there's a market when it's booming, people just invest in great people with ideas, things. And uh, when the market is like now today, we need more traction. We need more, you know, a lot of things. And uh, another dimension is that based on the fund. So I recognize that the fund with bigger AUM, bigger access and the management, they're likely to invest more in the less riskier stage. The, the fund with, you know, like uh, uh, smaller AUM and also they, they believe in the riskier things and they got uh, uh, competency in uh, building company. They believe in the riskier stage. And venture studio, they even riskier. Because, and so that's why they take more equity. That's the situation. So I do believe that um, it's a change through time to stage of the fund through um, a lot of things, but um, uh, normally people understand a pre-seed, seed, Series A, Series B, um, normally similarity. A everybody in the world got the same view on those things. Is that answer your question? You think so? Perfect, right? Okay, guys, uh, thanks very much. It's uh, uh, our show now. Is um, uh, you, you want to have a few words because we take the photo, Jamot? Right. Um... Well, actually, I'm going to make a bit of a pitch for myself, Tian, if I could. So <laughs> who, who in the audience is working on a fantastic business idea? <laughs> so good. you're my perfect thought. I've just written a new book. I'm going to promote this to you guys, which is how do you spot new ideas in advance? So for yeah, those of you who I, I will tell them about that. Yeah. Yeah, you can share a little bit. Um, actually, he's got a new book about um, uh, the um, how ideas come for, uh, for the um, entrepreneurs. Yeah, please, let us know more. Let's show some photo. No problem. So, um, so I'm not sure what's happening. You're taking a photo? Uh, no, no, no. I, um, I, uh, uh, please, tell us more about the, the oh. book that, that you try to show. Yeah. So, okay, um, for people without ideas, who don't have a great idea, that how do you spot ideas in advance? Like, how do you know where the Uber for tomorrow will come from, or the Uber of, of Vietnam, or the Airbnb of Vietnam, or whatever idea it will be? So the book is How to Use Economics to Spot New Ideas, which will hopefully become venture capital backed by Tien in um, in mm -hmm. um, in vietnam so so if yeah. you're interested if you are an uh, you would love to be an entrepreneur but you don't have any great ideas and you're hunting for ideas or you work in a big company where new business ideas are important it's about how to use the science of economics to spot the opportunities of tomorrow so i hope to come back in five years time and you're all wealthy entrepreneurs with fantastic ideas Ooh, there you go yeah, so this is uh, this is the book, as you see, it's um, the zero transaction cost entrepreneurs, and um, yeah, it's more about ideas and fundamentals, um, economic side of ideas. How come the ideas? So uh, I don't know if I uh, got enough energy and my time to translate it into Vietnam, uh, me, but you know, uh, it's uh, the book that that I like to read myself. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks. All right. So uh, thanks very much. So we got next step to do, and uh, we keep on the uh, relationship, keep on interaction. And I believe that um, Demont is uh, very uh, uh, generous to tell you that just hop on to Delta Partner uh, Island, and you can see his uh, calendar there if you want to talk to him about businesses and uh, ideas, things. Uh, yeah, 
yeah, he, he's the one that really like to have people. Yeah, but uh, I, I think um, uh, also busy, but uh, spend the whole um, uh, morning today with us. So please, guys, uh, I hope that we can come on stage and take a photo. Thank you.